it seems almost like everyone is an independent musician now or everyone is sort of a DIY artist to some extent and that's just that's more just I think the lay of the land these days. It allows you to do what you want really which is I think the main thing as well because you know it's it's sometimes frustrating because you don't maybe don't have the money to do whatever or you it's not as easy or you need to keep your J job or you know but I think all of that is 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 pretty much worth it just because you get to do exactly what you want to do. Where we came from there was I think there was really by the time we we were sort of in our early teens there was really only one or two places you could even play um, and <clears throat> I think we fast discovered that if you wanted to go to a really good show and see a really good band you know you really had to you, you really had to be that band and you had to put the show on yourself. For me it was always about just expression you know that's the way whether it's somebody were doing a fanzine doing music or whatever. indie labels like Discord and SST and Alternative Tentacles and those kind of labels that were a really clear reaction to what was going on in the music industry, the kind of ever encroaching marketing dollar which is kind of an attempt to reduce the, the, the language to a, a level that marketing people could actually discuss it on. You have this uh, traditional hierarchy of um, uh, big time promoters and um, major labels who have been operating what I would consider to be somewhat of a pretend industry that's, that's kind of based on these false economies, um, uh, very uh, surreptitious uh, business structures. I think that the, the, the independent scene in Ireland is, is a similar reaction. I mean, it's, there, there's not a lot of kind of clinical go-to places anymore. There's not go-to magazines. It's, it's become a very disparate kind of um, broken up industry. And so here, getting your voice heard is, is increasingly on any kind of international level and even on a local level to some degree is getting increasingly difficult despite the technology allowing for that to happen in a much more efficient way, I find. Um, so yeah, the, the kind of the gravitation towards independence is just a, a way to kind of reclaim your community, I think, and, and, and give your community some kind of musical cohesion outside of the parameters that major labels seem completely incapable of um, acknowledging or communicating within. we're at now is we're making music that essentially wouldn't be released by anybody but ourselves. So independence is almost a kind of a, an artistic necessity rather than a, um, <clears throat> a lifestyle choice, so to speak. Um, our previous records now, we, we definitely would have felt part of a kind of a, a movement um, in Dublin. There was, uh, at, the, at the time, a lot of bands with kind of a similar ethos emerged and released records on their own labels, and it really did feel part of a scene, and it felt very vibrant. Um, not that it isn't today, but just from our, from our own perspective. I was always into really melodic stuff, but then I got into American hardcore punk in quite a big way, like the Dead Kennedys and Minor Threat and that kind of stuff. So we formed a couple of crappy bands, and then we formed a fairly okay band called Black Belt Jones. And the Hope Collective asked us to do a benefit gig on one Christmas with Cheapskate and Bambi and Stomach, it was. Uh, and we were like, I was literally jumping around my sitting room with happiness that we were going to do this Hope Collective gig, because like they were all the gigs that I went to at the time was all these Hope Collective gigs they put on some, like they'd do really amazing gigs like Fugazi and then they'd also do really like smaller gigs like Los Crudos and all this kind of, just amazing stuff and went for being a young dude that really opened up my whole eyes to a lot of things that, you know, and a whole world basically that I didn't know existed. It was an interesting process, I thought the gig, the idea of a gig collective, one person made the poster, one person did the door, one person made the sandwiches for the band. Um, yeah, and it, just, it was, it was a very, pleasant, positive experience um, and a million miles from what you might have considered the music industry to be.
the realization that like this card is a is a is a dude like basically it's a couple of dudes like printing up records and doing things themselves that that was a really amazing realization for a lot of people so we just were like whoa cool we can just do this ourselves and that's how we did it discord would have been at the start the, the biggest inspiration for me in that you know i could do it myself i could uh release bands on my own i could do all this other stuff Um, I'd say Discord, Fugazi. Yeah. I think we only realised that we were a kin or a like to that after we'd already developed, like designed our own kind of way of doing things. So that was exciting to kind of, <clears throat> you know, look through these kind of, through his the history of, um, you know, these kind of musical movements and to be like, shit, that's just, what, that's you know, like, read, like listen to interviews for, of like, you know, Ian Mackay talk, it's like, you know, that's kind of what it was like whenever we were, you know, busting our shit to like try and get stuff together. I was th thinking back again to say maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, at that time, I felt definitely very much a part of, I guess, the punk scene and the DIY music scene in Dublin at the time. Um, to the extent that music was only an element of that community and there was other aspects to it. Um, even like 2004, 2005, there was the Red Ink bookshop, I think it was, in Temple Bar. Um, Bushy from Estelle had the record stall there as well. And there was lots, lots of radical literature and lots of people writing lots of fanzines and stuff like that at the time. Nowadays, it's, it's a bit more, I guess it's kind of vague in a way, I guess. I feel like more a part of a music community, very specifically music um, and relatively apolitical. The inherent relationship between punk and political stuff or DIY and political kind of beliefs, I do think is, is decreasing. And I don't see that necessarily as a bad thing, in my own opinion. Um, the creativity is the, is the part of it that I love, you know. Uh, so I don't really care if a band is completely apolitical or has no political views that are similar to mine at all. Um, I think the act of just saying, OK, I'm not going to wait for a label. I'm not going to wait for someone to come along and tell me what I'm doing is good. I'm just going to try to do it myself, you know, just get it out there, see how people react and keep building on that, you know. And I know that for some people, they, they really embrace the independent way of life as this political statement, uh, which is totally cool. But it's kind of like, one, it's one thing to one person, another thing to another person. Initially, just I was a, a, a record collector, um, a, a, a guy that hung out in, in record shops, uh, specifically in Freebird Records, actually. I would hang around there, uh, talking to the, the guy that worked behind the counter there, talking about records, learning about music, and. Yeah, I think that's where I would I'd pick up things like the Dublin Event Guide, the fanzines. There was always a lot of free sheets left on the counter there. You could just pick them up and read them. And uh, there was a, a, a free sheet uh, back then called uh, React, uh, which had a, a, a strong um, punk rock music slash lifestyle slant to it. Road Records is also a good spot for zines um, and free sheets especially. Road Records always had a, had a ton of, of the free sheets such as we've got the likes of, you know, React here, which was pretty massive. Put out quite consistently all the time by well-known Niall McGurk um, of Hope Collective. So that was a really good way of me knowing what was, what was happening. Uh, obviously, we're talking pre-internet, so it was, it was very hard to find out exactly what was happening in Dublin at the time. I guess this would be one of the kind of granddaddies of zines, Rejected. Um, obviously, this was done by Mero. Started out as a fanzine, turned into 
bands in on a label. Then the label spawned offshoots of that label. You know, there was um, a couple other labels that I went off to release more metal stuff or more kind of trad stuff. And then also the shop came soon enough after that that we had in the secret book and record store. Uh, Mero was good for putting out a, a lot of uh, Irish records at the time, I guess, when no one else was really putting stuff out. So I think there has to be some kind of debt paid to him in that regard. Did a good bit of stuff for Mero when he was in Dublin and running Rejected Records. And uh, six or seven years ago, just came back to screen printing and decided to figure it all out all over again. And uh, just decided to start approaching bands and seeing if I can if I can design and print short runs of posters for them to sell at gigs. My registration is never very tight. There's always like little, little misses in mind. There'll be an inky fingerprint here and there. And you know, at the end of a run, say you've got 50 posters, like, not, they're not all exactly the same as if they just ran out of a press. So each one is different, and I kind of like that about them, that they're not all identical, and that they are, there is a very limited uh, amount of them. When they're gone, they're gone. I, I never reprint a poster I've got. You know, some of the best scenes really are ones that are, they look really, really thrown together in a way, maybe to someone coming from an outside perspective might and might and might find it very busy or very intense about what's going on in different kind of in the art or in, in the contents, you know. A lot of it's handwritten, but I just think that personally adds to the aesthetic of it, uh, to the DIY mentality. The other big zine I suppose that has lasted all of them and is still going um, is Lose them. Obviously, I have a lot of respect for Anto. He's always been a, a, a big fan of fanzines over the years. Um, it's going from whew, the early to mid 90s. Um, and he's still going, he's still putting out issues. Uh, a lot of work went into Nosebleed. And it's, it's very archetypal Irish, you know, it kind of features a lot of stuff on the church, Irish society, and, and Boz's artwork is very well known. It was years and years he was doing it. His art improved over the years and the content of the zine, you know, the kind of more retrospective pieces about bands that would have existed, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s. And Boz be someone that would be quite a, I guess, punk historian, for want of a better word, too, and would have helped out a lot with the archive blog. Regards getting me copies of old zines or old recordings. So I would have got a lot of stuff off him over the years. So when you look, you know, you kind of consider that time in the early 90s, there would have been 20 or 30 Irish fanzines on the go, compared to now, where there's very, very few on the go. Um, I guess there's many reasons for that. The cost is so prohibitive. People really aren't as willing to maybe buy them because the information is, isn't as pertinent to them. A lot of the information can be gathered from the internet. People are obviously a lot more into blogs, so I guess that's part of the reason for the decline. I wouldn't have found out about half the bands, half the gigs, or anything when I was growing up um, behind being for fanzines. And I do, I, I love fanzines, I still do to this day. I, I think it's great when someone can produce something themselves. And you see how much love and caring goes into, into producing each thing. And just the expression, you know, people are expressing themselves, and that's so important, you know, in a world of how people really, a lot of times, don't want people to express how they feel about anything. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Probably about 2007-ish, like, things started to get interesting for me, personally. Um, you know, we had a lot of singer-songwriters in Ireland, and there was a lot of talk about the wheeling scene. You'd have stuff like Guy Browie taking the piss out of it. And that slowly started to die away a little bit, and then we got to the point where it just started to open up a bit, and we, we got to the stage where there was just, you know, there was no, it wasn't just singer-songwriters, it wasn't just folk singers. There was a lot of different music being made. A lot of, like, loud music, there was a lot of electronic music. And, and that's always been there, but I just felt like it really ramped up in those last five years, particularly. Whenever we first came to Belfast, the scene in Belfast was, because <clears throat> it was so small, I'm sure, 
probably same in, similar in Dublin, but the scene was too small to like be able to nurture a load of separate scenes because really there's you know there's just not enough people. So we found that <clears throat> there was just this, the Belfast scene just became this kind of melting pot, like Johnny said, of just loads of different bands. So the scene maybe didn't share a sound, but it certainly shared like an attitude of, um, you know, collectivity and um, and kind of like helping each other out. And, and uh, that was a really nice time to come of age in, uh, in Belfast, you know, a few years ago. Ireland, it's like we've had a hard time lately, but like, you know, there's some good shit going on here as well. People are kind of going, right, you know, and like as I said earlier on, like gigs that are happening in non-venues, bring your own things where you can go out for a tenner and have a brilliant night out, bottle of whiskey in your back pocket or what, whatever. It's been a few years now, but I think more people, that means more people are making music and more people have the time to make music because they're not working full time in a job that they hate. And um, so it means that they're focused on things they really like. And that actually means that more people are making better music. And uh, that's not been represented in terms of, you know, uh, support for, for Irish musicians from the government, but certainly it's something that maybe should. Everyone has to do the indie route now. And indie is about barter and it's about connections and it's about partnerships. And now the entire arts world is copying on to what probably music has always been doing, which is do it indie. Because indie, it looks like, is bringing you closer to your fan closer to your fellow artists and closer to the market than in previous years when, when the place was supposedly awash with money. Yourself, 2008 was a very, very difficult year for us. I think, you know, um, if you look back at all these economic analysis, they'll tell you this was the, the year when things started to go wrong uh, across the world. Um, I was probably less involved at that time than Dave because I'd taken time off because I was pregnant. And um, Dave was still, no, nope, got to keep going. But the money just didn't add up and we had already put a lot of our personal money in. And you just, there just comes a stage you have to think, can't do this anymore. So word got out, things weren't going too good, and this kind of organic um, movement started with a lot of our customers saying, no, not going to let the shop close because it's our shop. And, and I think that maybe that's the difference between Road and other shops. Our customers felt it was theirs as much as, as we felt it was ours. For a long, long time I've been pieces Road records, obviously. Like before I worked there, I was, you know, it was like my favorite, like every week I'd go there and spend spend a few quid. Uh, you know, I'd just like meet people there and, you know, kind of talk shit for a little while. Vinnie Dermody, who you spoke to, organized um, a benefit gig and um, that kept us going for a while. And we were really optimistic, really optimistic after that. But unfortunately, factors beyond our control, um, again, came in on us and two years down the road after exhausting every possibility and this time around Dave, Dave didn't feel so bad in 2008 he was like oh, no I can't let this happen a year and a half down the road it, he felt it was inevitable I had like a lot of records in my house I was pretty much it was inside, like in my, in my house in my bedroom there was like a thousand records and I really had nowhere to put it and then I heard that you know that Dave and Julie were closing down, which was a, uh, which is kind of a shame because I used to buy, you know, kind of the new release, my new releases there, and I used to buy tickets. Um, it's unfortunate for them, but I guess I was happy to, you know, kind of take it on and still, you know, kind of do like, you know, sell the local artists, um, you know, sell sell tickets to gigs and kind of, you know, keep the road tradition alive, but at the same time tweak it, you know, to what I knew, which is secondhand records mainly. I think it isn't just over and done with, with the likes of Gibb setting up Elastic Witch and stuff. It's a testament that if you're really interested in something and are passionate about something, you can do it. Um, and okay, maybe it won't last forever, but who wants things to last forever? Uh, we had a great time, heard some incredible musicians, 
And I'd like to think that even though road is ground to a halt, it's time for new things and new people to continue on doing what we did or do it in their own way and to give the city you know, the music and the record shops it deserves. I'm going to keep the stock minimal for wanting. I want to kind of have it in such a way that people can actually just come in here and, you know, without buying anything, just come in and have some coffee in here, meet their, meet their friends in here. The conversation generally starts in record shops. You walk in and you, you hear something or you meet someone or you see a poster and, you know, that's a conversation starts. Similar happens online, but... Uh, you know, th there's, no, th there's no real replacement for human contact and for human conversation, which you don't necessarily get online. So without record shops, I just think that the, the city's kind of culturally poorer for it and independent music will be kind of poorer for it as well. And it's important enough as a cultural thing for me to want them to exist. And I'm delighted that Elastic, uh, which has opened in Dublin, um, and I'm delighted that Plugged have made it work in Cork um, because um, those people that work there are involved in music more than just being people who stand behind counters selling e records. Um, they spread information, um, they encourage new talent, um, and they create environments that are good to be in. So that's important. They're, they're nice places, and I, I, I hope that. Uh, I don't think the record stores are going to. I think they'll. They'll struggle for a few years and then people will kind of cop on and then go, it's like the vinyl thing. Vinyl sales were down in the dumps and no one was buying it. And then with this whole like the digital download coupon, that's like the smartest thing that's been invented I, in years. I actually think that record stores, um, the people that are, the, the, the type of shop that's going to suffer the most is places like HMV um, or big record stores because people will stop buying that random crap music, it'll be in Tesco, it'll be online, you'll be mm. able to buy it on iTunes. The, the record stores that are at the bottom, well, what you say, the bottom of the, the mm. market, or whatever you want to call it, the, all the independent record stores, all the stores that are really about music, really about community. And more community, specialist. More specialist, they're going to survive. Record labels are doing a great job. You have the Richter Collective, Pop Island, Osaka, so many more, you know, and if you think about what they have to offer their bands, why would anybody ever go back to an overpriced studio and end up in hock for 100 grand to a record label who are just gonna like squash them down eventually? By signing to a major label in Ireland, you're saying to your audience, you know, you're saying to your label that, yeah, we're grand with Ireland and we're just going to stay here. And I think that's a really, like, it's a bad way of looking at things. And I don't know if bands realise that when they sign to major labels, that that's kind of what you're doing to yourself. You're like, that doesn't, isn't going both ways. And signing, signing yourself to an independent label or doing it yourself means that you have the freedom to go and do those things internationally. My bands are touring all over the world now, and it's from being able to hear and discover there's no barriers, and it's um, it's tricky for the old-fashioned systems because there's again they're so compartmentalized. It's like it used to be so physically demanding to actually cover territories. So you had sales forces and radio guys and da da da, and now it's just sort of you can have relationships without needing to do sales trips and you know all that stuff. Um, so being able to cut away, you know, I mean. I've managed to build a pretty, pretty significant label, not wasting resources and money on things that used to be very cost prohibitive. Because a lot of these releases were getting put out and it'd be like, you know, Funky Rooster Records 001. 
and then that would be it. There'd be like you'd never hear Funky Rooster zero zero two or anything. So we kind of twigged that it might be an idea to if we were going to put out our stuff, which we were all doing ourselves, just to have like one moniker, so you could have like you know a, more, a bigger catalogue. Because you know I think labels people trust labels as well as bands. You know, so it's a kind of a collective thing. We just approached it as as if I, I would have liked a label to approach me when when I was starting as a band. So a label that would just say, look. We understand you don't just need your record released. You know we can we can help you out with a couple of other things if you want. Um, and each each release was completely different to the others because some of them would you know need um, help with with gig contacts or you know booking tours, and some of them wouldn't need that at all. Some of them would just need you know uh, purely to have their record printed, and that's you know that's it. I worship and love the music that my bands make. When people say, what do you listen to? It's like my own bands. That's not a lie, that's straight up. You get in my car and there's six CDs and all six of them will be one of my bands. I don't do this for as a job. I started it by accident, by total love of music. I like seeing bands that we work with develop and, and release new, new stuff. Um, it's really all about, I know it's really corny and real cheesy, but it is about the music because if I was doing it for financial gain, I'd have given up a long time ago. Um, and I think everyone, I think everyone understands that as well, that it's not, um, it's never going to be something that's going to uh, make an awful lot of money, you know, but it, it's just something um, that I, I love to do. I love Adam B.C. Shank. I just sort of didn't get it live at the start. Like I think I got pushed away by all the pedals and stuff until I heard the first EP and then it all just clicked and I was like, ah, oh, it's just genius. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and we put on Adivisi in the skate park in Greystones. That was, that was either their first or second gig, I think. In a little room in the skate park, and Vinny jumped out the window <laughs> and ran around outside, still playing. And I think then I was like, oh, this is actually really good, how theatrical they are. Yeah, it's, it's totally good. full on. A lot of gigs going on in the lower deck at the time, and I remember seeing Adam BC there, and it was just, you know, never heard anything like it. There seemed something more about the gigs. There was some sort of community, you know, about those about those gigs. He got to check out his band, Adam BC Shank, and so we checked them out, and we were like, holy fuck, like this is like, you know, we kind of instantly felt a bit of connection with them because it was like, shit, these guys are like. You know, it's, it's of course it sounds different, but they're doing they're they're, tr they're doing something that you know feels like familiar to us. You know, Adibisi's album launch, first album launch, was the big game changer. I remember being part of that sea of people just moving over, and I was right there, and I'm like. Oh my God, if I fall, I'll be impaled on this guitar and I will die in the rock, you know? And I was just like, you know what, I don't care, I'll be amazing. I was ready to just fall. And the weird thing is though, all those people around you, they never let anyone fall either, you know? Like, everybody looks out for one another and that's another awesome thing. We can kind of see the kind of trend, like the progression of bands, like, in the 90s, you know, you had bands like the Waltons and stuff like that, and I see how that kind of influenced bands that came after them, such as, like the Abadizi, you can see that there is kind of a, a progression between those bands, and that there's something very kind of intrinsically Irish about that sound.
Yeah, there seems to be a lot of instrumental Irish bands. I don't think the Rednecks really influenced that as much as people think they did. I just think it's just something about the Irish character, maybe, or something. It's like it's, you just rock out and that's enough without the voice over the top of it. I think people have, you know, likened us to the, the trad sound and stuff, you know. Like I've always, I think every time we hear that, our like hearts swell with pride a bit because, you know, all our parents would have listened to trad music growing up and certainly my, my dad, you know, w w actually, you know, would have been in that kind of fly scene, you know, and touring about and playing tin whistle and so I grew up certainly with a lot of that. So it's nice to know that that subconsciously, I suppose, maybe kind of has uh, seeped into some of our tunes. <laughs> It's really good to see bands like Al BC and so I watch them afar because when I look at them now, like I jump around the stage and I'm kind of going, we used to like we used to do that, you know? We used to be kind of like jumping around like crazy men on stage. I remember sending them an email to uh, to Out of BC Shank, whatever their band email was or whatever, and I said, I love your band, I, you know, I'm from Sergeant House and I love your band and I want to talk to you. And I get an email back from Mick at Richter Collective. And I didn't know it was Mick, the drummer, and I was like, I don't want to talk to your label, I want to talk to you. And he's like, but I'm the drummer in the band, I just also have this label. I was like, that is so cool, as soon as it's like, I love... Again, I love people that um, get involved. It was totally, it was never going to go past the practice room. It was just going to be um, just to have, have a bit of crack in, in a practice room. Let's, let's see what happens. And I didn't know that that was the band that was going to actually keep, keep going and do the most for me, you know, as far as getting contacts and, and f furthering my career. <laughs> I mean, you get something like out of BC and it's, you know, it's all over the place and that's uh, great because it's just blows that concept out of the water in terms of what, a, what an instrumental band could be and how they can sound. And that's always a good thing for me, you know, anything that kind of exceeds or uh, confounds expectation like out of BC Shank do. Well, out of BC are one of those bands who probably should get signed to a, a really good major and wouldn't have compromised themselves in any way to get there. Um, they, they, they've got a really amazing way to, to balance experimentation and actual ho like hooks that would get you heard and, and known. So, again, if they, if they went from being an independent band to a major label band, nothing would have been lost in the conversation. With regards to kind of being self managed and self promoting and stuff like that like it's like a it's a constant weekly thing where I just you can find <clears throat> every kind of company on the internet and find email addresses and like I was emailing people in Japan yesterday just chancing my arm because you know you can send a hundred emails and if one of them is a yes then it's worth sending 99 no's you know people saw it over the years and saw the uses in in digital technology like that more people were able to do their own home recordings, you know, easier to do a layout for, for a record. Um, and there has been a better DIY network ha has built up over the years. And I think the doors have opened a lot more for, for uh, independent artists to, to do everything themselves, just from distribution, marketing, booking, you know, it's the last kind of gate that's just been opened for, for independent music. <laughs> Thank you.
When we first started touring, like our f the first time we were in the UK and we went to London, we were just in Rory's car with all this amps and stuff packed around us. And an atlas. No, uh, no not even no an atlas. Not oh even no, that's right, we didn't. First we made it. A globe. We <laughs> we, we, the first time we went to London, <laughs> the first time we played in London, we drove there with no map or, or GPS or anything, and it was our thinking that you could drive to London and just start asking people where stuff was. So it's like, oh, do you know where, uh, you know, the water rats are, is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the other side of London. It's like, all right, well, we'll probably head towards there and then ask somebody. So it began very naively. I think it does make it easier to contact people for touring and things like this, you know. I can't imagine what touring in, in the 80s and 90s was like when, you know, you'd be having to call people from pay phones when you'd be going to different cities every day trying to find your way around it. You know, now you've got GPSs when you're on tour, you can go straight to the venue, you can find it in any country. When I was touring in France a couple of years ago, you know, I didn't know any of these streets, we put the address in and it gets us there. We're like a punk band as a label, we operate going, look at all these free resources, why would we, you know, why would we hire someone to create a digital platform for our label store when we can use these things like Bandcamp on our own? Um, Tumblr, our entire website is built out of a Tumblr. So all you need to do is buy a URL, make a front page, click, boom, into these free tools that then people can reblog stories. It's really a, a great system. Technology is just an enabler for, for that. And it's still down. You still have to be good at all of the other things you have to be good at 20 years ago as a band. SoundCloud has a community of users. The people who are uploading um, audio are people who want to create and share. So this whole community of sound creators um, for a musician, and they may even meet other musicians online who can talk to and then from there create their own music or remix their track. So even people are finding bands online on SoundCloud. So in terms of who my next project's gonna work with. So there's a whole community. And also on that side as well, in um, enabling independent music especially, in terms of how labels and also PRs and bloggers, how it helps their process of finding bands and bands to get in touch with them, and also how they share and push them bands across the web. The stuff that we do for MAP, which is the Music Alliance Pact, that's been a great thing over the last few years, because what we do there is there's 30 odd, 36 bloggers who get together every month, and we all nominate a track from our home country. It's great to be in a position where you can get so many ears and so many people listening to that song that you really like and just through the power of numbers and the power of like bloggers combining and kind of working together. It's an, and it's also a really interesting concept as well in terms of like, well, this is what's happening in Ireland at the moment. It's what I really like. So we've travelled a lot over the years and we've gone to countries like Malaysia and Mexico, especially Malaysia would be somewhere where people wouldn't have access to, to buying records from Europe. It would cost far too much. It's prohibitive to them, you know, so they really can't do it. So MP3s are very important in like developing countries, I think, as well, in regards to you know punk and hardcore and just any sort of DIY or independent music. You need to, to, to use those technologies to, to kind of reach out to people in those countries. I think what happened was that in a very, in a ver in a very sort of oversimplified way, I think there was the Celtic Tiger and people started to have a lot of money. And at the same time, technology in terms of uh, musical equipment, recording equipment, became a lot more prolific and it became a lot easier to buy these, buy that kind of equipment over the internet. It became a lot easier to learn about using that equipment over the internet. Um, so I guess if we're to use a sort of cr crude, sort of Marxist analysis or something like that, it's kind of like the means of production were returned back to the hands of the, the music workers or the craft, the music craft people. So that um, all the red tape of expensive recording studios and knowledge the knowledge around recording, professional recording, good sound records, was sort of uh, popularised. I think the fact that we're about musicians is almost works like advertising. Because if someone sees your band play one night and they're in a band similar or, you know, thought your band was awesome or whatever, they might hear from someone else that, you know, the guy in that band has a studio, maybe you should go record with him like they recorded their, their last thing, check it it's out. It's great, you're constantly out there meeting the people who want your service. It's, yeah. it's perfect, like, 
And especially with recording, the work source speaks for itself, you know. There's not much need to advertise, you know. Yeah. People hear it if they want it. All they have to do is look at the, the back of the inlay of whatever they're listening to. started when Pterodactyl were down recording for the weekend and at one, maybe the second night they were down, Anzi was playing some songs in the sitting room uh, on the acoustic guitar and just said to him that if he was interested in recording it, that would be up for coming down and doing it. And then we ended up recording the album here over like, over, I don't know, about the space of a year or something. So the first time we came in, we were just kind of doing it for the crack. And, so it just kind of made sense to do it again this way because it's the most comfortable, it's the most comfortable way I've come across recording anyway. There's no major time constraints in terms of paying a lot, of, paying like, you know, 200 euros an hour in a professional studio and all that kind of stuff. And and aside from that, it's just really relaxed. Um, just having a cup of tea and recording. And this is another one of the perks. <sighs> um, I'm usually doing heavy bands, so it was there was a learning curve involved for both of us, I think. Um, but it was good, it's nice. It's easy work, just working with one person the time it's quite relaxed. Really feel like you're getting back to nature. I was doing web design, I had this website, I wanted to use it for something. So I thought I'd put up a blog and like it ended up, it started off being just stuff I liked. It ended up very quickly being, within a couple of weeks being, you know, a blog about music and the music that I liked and I wanted to have somewhere that I could, you know, send my mates so that I wasn't annoying them about music all the time. You know, so that's what I came about. And then I kind of grew up into, you know, learning how to write about music and all that kind of way. And it became something I really enjoyed. The internet and blogging has allowed a lot of people who were maybe just really into music. Like maybe 10 years ago, people were like really into music just and love to talk about it. Blogs have given sort of those sort of people who aren't necessarily journalists or whatever, a chance to like develop into, you know, in, like into an area where they can be heard by a lot of people. I think that's... People like seem to value their opinion a lot more because they're treated as, as just somebody that you would chat to at a show or in the street. You wouldn't be like, oh, there's such and such from that newspaper or magazine or whatever. I think the way that blogs can help bands and music industry is by the way that they get people out to the live shows, which is where the money is. Everything that I hear for the first time, 99% of it will be something that I've heard online from, from a blog or from a, a website or, you know, or just even a link that on someone's, you know, someone's Twitter account or something like that. Uh, and then that will often lead me to buy the physical product of it. Uh, but yeah, like physical product, it's a tangible thing. And a lot, of, a lot of vinyl albums at the moment, they do download codes with it, which I think was, Whoever came up with that, tip my hat to them as, as well. Like it was, a, it was a really good idea. Uh, it's only kind of surfaced about maybe in the last three, four years. Maybe that that kind of thing is starting to happen. But I mean, f people feel like they're kind of getting two things when they buy a, an album and there's a download code in it. Because like that's like you can't get on a bus with your record player uh, and listen to it on the way into town. You could try, but uh, it'd probably skip a little bit. <laughs> I'd much prefer to sell 300 records than sell 5,000 downloads. Just simply, even if our music was getting to less people, I'd much rather that the, it was documented in a beautiful and meaningful and kind of a, with, a, with, a, with an eye towards longevity rather than somebody getting it, buying it, listening to it, and it just becoming one file and 50,000 on, on a computer. And people respect vinyl. I mean, physically respect it. People are always very careful when they, when they put it on, they clean it, they know to get a new needle. I mean, to be honest, CDs in my house anywhere tend to be thrown around. You'd never do that with your records or your seven inches, you know? As an artist, um, I love vinyl. I, I love it. Um, it's so expensive and 
it's it's hard to do it's hard to justify it unless the band tour all the time because in reality if you sell vinyl through distribution you're going to make no money you know it doesn't make money through distribution so it has to be a band that just tours all the time before you can really justify it um justify making it because people at gigs always buy vinyl you know And so we watched them before. They've taken to and they've taken the whole thing to another level. You know, I mean, they've they've worked with the Richter Collective and they've also worked with Small Town America in uh, in, in terms of getting the thing out there. But I think with So We Watched Them Before, the big thing with them is gigs. And like, I mean, they they just gig, 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 gig. And every time they gig, like, I mean, they're adding more people to the fan base. We don't really congratulate ourselves very much. It's always like, as soon as something good happens, we're always looking for the next step rather than kind of basking in the glory. So it's a bit of a strange one. We don't really think it in that terms. Now and again, you get a moment where you just think, OK, that's what a year of sleeping in the back of a van has led to, and that's what a year of sitting at the laptop for 12 hours a day has led to. But generally, we're always thinking the future rather than what's happening right now. DIY doesn't mean do it all yourself. It means, you know, collaborate and you know, talk to people and work with people you like and I don't know, there's just there's a nice there's just a nice vibe in Ireland at the minute. And there's a lot there's like the beginnings of this kind of infrastructure which was wasn't there at the start. Music from Ireland, which is a project of First Music Contact. We've just arrived at Spotlight Country at this year's uh, Great Escape 2011. Um, ahead of us is three days of chatting to people about Irish music in general, promoting 10 Irish bands at all their gigs, uh, participating in delivering panels on the music industry, and generally making sure that after the Great Escape 2011, people are more aware of Irish music. We uh, showcase bands from all over the world, and every year we put a special focus on the artists from one country in particular. Um, and yeah, and this year we, we made the decision that Ireland was the right country to put the spotlight on. Nowadays, for a band, it's not about getting a record deal. It's not about like getting a post deal. It's about really, it's about completing your team. It's about almost, almost like being like uh, Kenny Dalglish or Alex Ferguson during the close season. You're trying to get all the main components in place. You need an agent. You need a manager. You need a publicist. You need a plugger. You need a distributor. You need someone who's, who's going to look after your merchandising. So for many of the bands, it's a chance to plug those gaps. With halves, I mean, we kind of have this kind of cottage industry thing. It's like, it's the bones of the band is three people and we have no manager, we have no label. We, you know, it's all done ourselves. And at the moment, you know, we're, we're happy with how we work as a unit, but it takes up a lot of our time. And, you know, it's, we can't do everything that we kind of want to do. The Irish music industry has always been DIY, you know, it always has been DIY. They, 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 yeah, you, you really have the big major label spinning sprees that you would have over here, for example, all the time. You know, that when, like, if you look at last year in terms of the like, amount of albums that were released, there was tons of albums we released because bands are doing it under their own steam. But to be honest, I don't find that n anything new about that. I mean, it, to me, it's the most logical thing to do. If someone isn't going to pay for you to record an album and you want to record an album, well, record your album yourself and put it out yourself. I think the ethos of independence is to push the boat out to, to, and to challenge people and to present ideas that are not immediately digestible and take some time to process and as a result you have a much kind of greater understanding of, of art and a greater understanding of, um, of music because that means you can understand sim the simple ideas and the complicated ideas and then you can, you, you can approach music as a, as, a, as a holistic thing and, and just kind of listen just, you know, without kind of prejudice and go, yeah, this is all part of the same conversation. 
you know, you're either lucky and you meet people you work really well with, or you're unlucky and you meet people you don't work well with. But either way, you're learning, you know, so you're going, well, this venue is great, this guy's amazing, he's a great promoter, we go with him again, or else this guy's a total chancer, knock him off the list. And over the years, if you just keep doing stuff, then eventually, you, 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 in all different areas, not just promote promoters, but every area, you, you build up a collection of people that you work well with, and you can just kind of like continue to tap that, you know? Independent distribution companies and independent record labels are very lean machines. There's no excess fat. They're in it because they like the music and they want to get the music out there. So, you know, I think they will, they have a better chance of survival than, say, the, the, the dinosaurs maybe that are EMI or Sony. You see even people's people's own progression, um, you know, people who would be in a, in a pop punk band then end up in a kind of more shoegaze band and you can see people just how they're progressing themselves within, within a music scene. Um, obviously, you know, people aren't going to want to stay into the same music for, forever, but I think the DIY aspect, you know, we've got somebody, say, like Jape, like Richie Egan, you know, came from Black Belt Jones, came from that sort of Kellogg and that punk background and in a lot of ways carries that through to his music today as well. Um, the amount of control he wants over his products, the amount of passion he puts into it, you know, not wanting to do something shoddy, not wanting to kind of use it as an excuse to put out a bad product, and just wanting to have that control so you don't have to compromise yourself. This way, you do it on a passionate level, and you can do a gig that can stay with people for the rest of their lives. Like, I saw Sweep the Leg Johnny play, blew me away, it, like, stayed with me for the rest of my life. Lost Crudos as well, tiny little gig, 100 people. It's made a huge impact on my, my life, you know, and that's the kind of stuff that you can, re you can sustain, you can regenerate it, and you can look at yourself in the mirror and be happy that you did something that, you know, you're, you can did something dignified rather than trying to whore yourself out for some f reason that just makes you feel shitty at the end of the day. I think the majority of number ones in this country, like the top ten, are the majority of sales are through Tesco's, which is... It's horrible. Well, it, it shows you how, how much it matters. You know, how much it matters to these people where they sell it. They're just like, no, no, we'll just sell it anywhere. And it's just funny because you can kind of... You can kind of in a supermarket, you, you know. You get your Adele CD <laughs> and you get your toilet paper. You get your toilet paper, yeah. I think that these talent show, television talent shows and YouTube and all that stuff has given people a really skewed sense of how fame or fortune comes from music. And I also think they're all forgetting that where the fuck is, you know, where are all those people from American Idol or, you know, X Factor four seasons ago? You know, is it really success or, you know, is that real? I, I almost see the music industry like a, a, um, a playground for these almost adult baby type characters who don't really want to have real jobs, want to live in this sort of fantasy world where it's um, um, important to sell music. Um, and it, it's not real, and I like an aspect of that as well because I'm part of that, and I prefer working in this industry than than, I, than, than, than having to, to be an, a, an accountant or have a real job. But 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 I, ha I think we have to be honest about it. It's a it's a it's a slightly ridiculous industry. The hard working class here has had a few uh, Q and A's and talks, and I know this, the, the Twisted Pepper held a few of them as well. But for the most part, they take place in venues with small amounts of people. And you know, I'd like to see what you guys are trying to do here is to actually get a genuine, you know, conversation started that will that, that will last and will and, and will actually um, maybe iron out, iron out a few of the creases that, that that independent music has and give people more of a sense of what what it is they want to achieve and what it is that maybe as a community we want to achieve. Um, so. Essentially, it's still just a, it's, it's still a, a joyful slog. It always has been. That's what being an independent musician is, um, and that hasn't changed.
shoulder like the rest of us. Taper at the shoulder like the rest of us.